Hello and welcome everyone. Please come in and join. Some of you might have seen my talk on Thursday, but for those who haven't, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Tobias Görgens. I'm a 22-year-old student from the Hessel Platten Institute in Potsdam, and I work on different OpenSUSE-related projects in my free time. And I brought a question for all of you. How often do you start your PC per day? Okay, maybe not that often. And per week? Hmm, a few times? Per month? Well, I couldn't count that. And per year? Personally, very often, to be honest. But why do I ask this weird question? Well, have you ever thought about how a computer actually starts up? I mean, first, you get a screen like this, where you can press the key to enter the BIOS or, on a modern system, UEFI settings. Then, you get a nice little screen that looks like this, at least on OpenSUSE. Here, you can select to boot OpenSUSE, either directly or from a snapshot. And then, after a while, a boot animation of some kind starts, and you can log in. Simple. But wait, let's go back a few steps. We suddenly went from this step, where my PC doesn't even know all of my hardware devices, to this part, where something just knows that I have OpenSUSE installed. How exactly does this work? Is it magic? Well, probably not magic. Somehow, we have a little program that runs right after the UEFI, and we can select what operating system we want to start. But wait again, this means our operating system hasn't started yet. Where do these options come from? How does my PC know what to do when I select something? It's actually quite complicated. But luckily, we can break it down a bit. Well, maybe not that simple. What it comes down to is, the bootloader has to tell the PC where the US is located and where it should load it from. A lot of the initialization components have been placed in other modules. So when using these components, the bootloader really has, just has to tell the PC, use this specific file and other components take over. So maybe it is that simple nowadays. But as I said, the bootloader has to use these components. And unfortunately, the default bootloader used by OpenSUSE, Grub, doesn't really do that. And this creates multiple long-standing issues. For example, OpenSUSE, like most other Linux distributions, supports encryption of your system partition to keep your data safe. This means that when you start your system, you first have to enter your password. However, since a lot of the files Grub uses in the boot process are on the system partition, Grub first has to unlock the disk, and then loads the boot menu, and then starts the system. Grub accesses your system partition and the file system on it, like X4 or ButterFS, and has to understand them. So it has their drivers included, and, of course, the ability to read and unlock encrypted files. All of these components, however, are already part of the Linux kernel itself, and Grub has to ship a modified version of them. Even worse, Grub is way slower than the kernel in unlocking the disk. All right, now that we know the problems, what is the solution? To find a suitable solution, we need to know a few more things about how modern PC, or PCs younger than 10 to 15 years, generally start. On the hard drive, where a system is located on, is an extra partition. It is formatted with a simple FAT32 file system called the EFI partition, or ESP, short for EFI system partition. This partition is unencrypted and designed to contain all files required for the boot process of your PC. So, a simple solution would be, just place all files required for boot on the ESP, and we are good. Unfortunately, Grub doesn't support that yet on OpenSUSE. Also, it would be great if OpenSUSE doesn't completely depend on Grub, but could switch to an alternative bootloader if wanted. 
For this, the bootloader specification is useful. The bootloader specification is a document that describes where files should be located on the IFI partition to be found by a bootloader supporting it. There already is a patch for Grub to support the bootloader specification, but it's not final yet and has some issues. However, there already is a bootloader supporting it today, systemd boot. Here you can see how systemd boot looks like on OpenSUSE. It's fairly minimalistic and simple, but this also means that it's small and responsive. With systemd boot, all files required for boot are located on the EFI partition. Full disk encryption is no problem anymore, as systemd boot doesn't have to access the encrypted system. Now, the Linux kernel can handle unlocking the drive, making it way faster compared to Grub. Another advantage, systemd boot doesn't need to understand different file systems, but just FAT32 on the ESP, which is comparably simple. Systemd boot is only part of a bigger program suite, just called systemd. Since OpenSUSE uses systemd, all components they offer are available to us. This is beneficial because we have to solve another problem. We know where we have to place the files on the ESP thanks to the bootloader specification. But what files are actually required on it? First of all, we need the bootloader binary itself, so systemd boot. This binary reads some configuration files and displays the simple menu we have seen before. When an entry is selected, it handles the initialization of the selected system. Then we need the Linux kernel. This is the core component of every Linux-based operating system. Its main purpose is to manage the communication between software and hardware components, but also manage resource usage of software processes. Then we need a so-called initial RAM disk, or short, initRD. This is a package of files and binaries that gets loaded early on in your system's memory. The initRD contains essential configurations and drivers that are used to find the system partition and mount it. After the initRD phase, it is available and all files on it are accessible. And last but not least, we need a configuration file. The configuration files are used by systemd boot to create the boot entries. I will later show you an example. It's really just a text file. And that's basically it. When all of these components are placed at the right location, our system will successfully boot. But wait a second. What component actually copies these files on the ESP now? Good question. Kernel install is part of systemd and is a program that gets called when a new kernel is installed on the system. It automatically handles copying the kernel and initRD to the EFI partition and creating the boot entry configuration file for it. Hence the name kernel install. Another tool systemd has is boot control. Boot control is a utility to manage the state of the installed bootloader and the command boot control install automatically copies the bootloader on the ESP. So everything is solved, right? We just use systemd boot with boot control and kernel install does the rest. Unfortunately, no. Let's go back to the grub menu. With systemd boot, we would want to have the same functionality that grub currently offers. And we not only have an entry to boot OpenSUSE, but also an entry to boot from a read-only snapshot. If you don't know what a snapshot is, imagine it as a state of your system, like a backup of the file system done very efficiently. These snapshots are all states of your OpenSUSE system that can be used to, for example, recover an older version should an update fail. The issue is, kernel install handles boot configurations only for the current system. We would lose access to our snapshots and in the worst case, won't be able to easily recover our system. And snapshots aren't handled equally across OpenSUSE distributions. There are two ways how snapshots are used. So let's see how we would need to manage them. The first way is the new approach used by distributions like MicroS or Ion. On these platforms, snapshots are read-only for the user, so you can't change them. The current snapshot might be, for example, version 42. When an update is available, a new snapshot is created, copying the current system state. 
Then the update is installed into the new snapshot. After the update has been applied, the new snapshot is marked as read-only. Next, the necessary boot files from the snapshot, so potentially a new kernel and init RD, are copied to the EFI partition and a new boot entry configuration file is created. The last step is to set the newly created menu entry as default, and on reboot, the system boots into the new updated version. The alternative to all of this is the traditional approach used by distributions like OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. Here, you have read-write access to a current snapshot, for example, again, snapshot 42. When you run a command to update your system, a read-only snapshot is created before the update process starts. After creation, the necessary boot files are added to the EFI partition for the new snapshot. Then, the actual update happens, but instead of writing it to the newly created snapshot, it is applied to the current system snapshot. The update might have installed or removed a kernel, so the boot files are updated for the snapshot as well. After all of that happened, another snapshot is created, marking the state well of after the update. And for this snapshot, the necessary boot files are also added to the EFI partition. These two different approaches mean that we need to handle them separately. On Tumbleweed, we would mark to we would want to mark the read-only snapshot for the user as read-only, and on Ion, they should not be distinguishable. Sounds complicated, right? Turns out, it is. There are several approaches to get upstream support in systemd for our requirements, but so far it didn't completely work out. A former employee at SUSE, Ludwig Nussel, didn't want to wait until everything is upstream and created his own solution. Let's introduce SDBootUtil. SDBootUtil is the glue that brings all of the mentioned components together. It was thought as a temporary proof of concept to show that OpenSUSE can indeed use the existing components already. Well, it became a little bit more than just a proof of concept. Today, SDBootUtil can be used to install the bootloader, it supports scrub and system deboot, install and remove different kernel versions, install and remove different init RD versions, manage the bootloader configuration entries for the different snapshot, kernel and init RD combinations, and quite new, supports measured boot with TPM, if you don't know what this is, don't worry, we will talk about it later, supports secure boot, so everything is digitally signed properly, oh, and all of that with a working snapper integration to make your snapshots bootable, handling both snapshot approaches. Whew. Well, that's a lot. Before we go into how SDBoot does all of that, let me show you how an end user currently running Tumbleweed could switch to systemd boot on OpenSUSE and profit from the benefits today. I've prepared a virtual machine here. Let me quickly log in. And the welcome app is broken, okay. But I have a text document and these are all commands you have to run to switch from grub to systemd boot. So, let me open a terminal, and we just paste them. It will ask for my password. So, what we now have to do is, Yes, currently thinks we are running grub2, but we want to switch to systemd boot, so we will have to mark this as empty. Then we have to remove the UEFI boot entries that the UEFI shows for OpenSUSE because else it would try to boot grub, but it isn't there anymore. So let me re remove those. Then we remove the grub files that are already on the ESP. And now we install sdbootutil. As you'll see, it will remove grub2, and we do that. Yes, please. And then there are just two commands left. We wait until the installation is finished. Play systemd. 
Zipper really isn't the fastest tool. Might be, yeah, the man page updater. So now what we do with sdboot util install is we install the necessary boot files for the bootloader on the ESP. And with this command, let me quickly add a minus V flag so we can see a little bit more. This will add the kernels that we currently have to the ESP. So it's now generating a new init ID file, as I mentioned a few times already. It now installs the second kernel we have currently installed. And we're done. And now let's hope that when I reboot, I've not completely destroyed the VM. Okay. To see the menu on boot, you can... Oh, okay, it wasn't fast enough. Um, you can hold the, the space bar key and then, where's my mouse? Here's my mouse. Let me quickly reset it. But at least it booted, so that worked. And another try. Uh, please. No, it's too fast. Okay, it doesn't matter. System boot works. I promise you it's installed now, because else it wouldn't boot. We have removed grub2, and it's pretty fast. Okay, so let me quickly switch back to my presentation. One second. All right. Now, you have seen the demo, and probably all of you have just one question in their mind right now. Why does sdbootutil have to have its own command to insert the bootloader when I talked about how we want to use systemd's components and their tools, and boot control already supports insta installing the bootloader, as I've mentioned before? Are we stupid? Well, maybe, but certainly not because of this one. The issue is, as I said, we want the same feature set as OpenSUSE has with Grub. And with Grub, Secure Boot is supported, which means that only boot files signed by Microsoft can be used. And for that, we need Shim. Shim is a little tool that runs right before the actual bootloader, and that's the file signed by Microsoft. Shim itself has its own certificates and verifies that Grub or Systemd boot are signed by OpenSUSE themselves. However, boot control doesn't support Shim yet. Secure boot wouldn't work if Systemd boot was installed using boot control. Now that we know why we manage installing the bootloader ourselves, how do we install a kernel? With Systemd's kernel install I mentioned earlier, right? Unfortunately, this is also not possible. When a kernel gets installed, we can just replace the script that gets called when a kernel is installed and make them call anything else. So we could call kernel install for that. Unfortunately, there's also a hard part. The space on the ESP is very limited, often below one gigabyte. Since one kernel and one init RD are about 100 megabyte in size, we do not want to copy a new kernel and init RD per snapshot, as each snapshot could contain multiple kernel versions. Instead, we need to reuse kernels and init RDs as often as possible. And that's not really easy. The trivial solution would be to just copy the kernel to the ESP, and if the kernel gets updated, the kernel version changes. So the kernel has a different name, and round replace the old one, and everything is fine, right? Unfortunately, again, no. It is possible that the kernel gets updated, but the kernel version stays the same. This happens, for example, when the compiler, so the source code to machine code translator, gets updated. Then the kernel is rebuilt, but still has the same version and would replace the old kernel on the ESP. To detect these situations, we use hashing. Explaining that in detail is unfortunately out of scope for this presentation, but in a nutshell, this means that we inspect the file and create a string of numbers and letters that identifies the content of it. This way, we can detect when two files are not really identical, even if they have the same name. We append the hash, or also called checksum, to the file name. If the kernel gets updated, but the version doesn't change, the checksum will change, and we don't overwrite the old kernel. We now place the new kernel next to the old one and link the new entries against it. We also hash the init RD files I mentioned a few times already, so they might also change and we want to detect this. 
Now we have the kernel and the initRG on our ESP. The only thing missing is the configuration file creating the actual boot menu entry. This one is quite easy again. I brought you an example. First, we define the title that the entry should have. So, for example, open to the tumbleweed. Then we set the version. This usually contains the kernel version, but the snapshot is also of interest, so we add it as well. We set some options. This tells the kernel what the root partition is. And with the root flex argument, we tell the kernel what snapshot we want to use. There are usually some other parameters here, but they're not that interesting. At the end, we tell systemd boot where it can find the Linux kernel file and the initRD file on the ESP. In this file, we can define some other parameters as well, but these are not important at the moment. The file name is a combination of an identifier for the operating system. This might be the name, then the kernel version, and the snapshot number the entry belongs to. Whenever we create a new snapshot, we check if we can reuse the kernel and init RD and create a new configuration file. When we do a rollback to an older snapshot, it's basically the same. On Tumbleweed, we create a new snapshot with read-write access and new entries for it. On MicroS or Aeon, we would just reuse the entries we had anyway, or if they got deleted, create new ones. Simple. And how do we know when files can be removed again? I don't want old kernels to linger around on my small ESP when they're not used anymore. Again, good question. Every bootloader configuration file points to a kernel and init RD, and only those kernels and init RDs that are referred in any boot menu configuration can actually be booted. So all we have to do is to track whether after removing an entry file, other entry files still refer to the kernel and init RDs referenced in it. And luckily, boot control already handles that for us. When removing an entry using boot control unlink with the ID of an entry, it automatically removes any state file, any stale file that now exists. Pretty cool, right? Almost everything I've shown so far is also possible with OpenSUSE and CROP. Are there any other benefits when using SD Boot Util? Yes. Yes, there are. At the end of last year, another SUSE employee, Alberto Planas, added support for the Trusted Platform Module, or short, TPM. This means that when your system partition is encrypted, a key to unlock it is stored in your TPM, a security chip on your CPU. Instead of entering the password manually on every boot, the TPM can provide the key to unlock the disk as long as specified prerequisites are fulfilled. Only when all boot components are in their original state, so no attacker has tampered with your system, the TPM unlocks the partition. This is called measured boot. Should the physical hard drive be stolen, the data is still safe and encrypted on there. And is the project finished now? Are we done? No, we are not even close. Just a week ago, we introduced improvements to the behavior of SD Boot Utah when the ESP is running out of space. Before we made these changes, the running operation would just fail, and the user had to manually make some space on the ESP, for example, by calling SD Boot Utah to remove old entries. Now, SD Boot Util tries to remove old entries automatically, but keeps at least a few known good snapshots. This way, it's very likely that you will never run out of space on your ESP, but you can still be confident that the system stays bootable. A limiting factor is that SD Boot Util is currently one big bash script. While that makes it accessible and easy to understand, bash has quite a few limitations. And this is why I'm currently working on porting STBootUtil to Rust, a programming language known for its safety features. In the end, STBootUtil shouldn't really exist. We want to upstream as many features as possible to SystemD and other projects. There's already some work ongoing, but this is really going to take a while. For example, the duplicated functionality of installing the bootloader should in the best case be handled by boot control. However, we are not sure if everything will fit an existing project, so SD Boot Utility will probably be around for some time. If you got interested in this topic, feel free to reach out to us. 
We would really love new contributors, and it doesn't matter if you're an experienced developer or not. If you feel comfortable with the command line, you would love some testers. Migrate your existing OpenSUSE system to systemd boot, or use the ex experimental installation option. And if you find a bug, report it. Or if you have a great idea what should be added to SD Boot Utility, do not hesitate. Our GitHub is open to everyone. And we also have a wiki page describing how to migrate from Grub to systemd boot using SD Boot Utility. Check it out. I hope you like this presentation, and I guess the main takeaway is the most temporary solution is always the most permanent one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Hi, so in a few aspects of this, you said that Grub isn't capable of doing a bunch of things, but I can do all this now with Grub, and I do. Almost everything. Everything. Mm, almost everything. For example, one disadvantage Grub has is that the unlocking of the system partition is really slow, and this so would change probably. And so, so what I do instead is I have a separate boot partition that contains the kernel and the initRD and Grub, and Grub does the TPM measurement itself. Yeah, but then you need an extra partition for the boot partition, and that's also not really a nice solution. As opposed to having a gigantic EFI partition? Well, we don't place everything we have in the boot partition on the ESP. I understand that, but my, my separate Grub partition is 2 gig, and outside of the TPM-specific functionality, it works on every architecture, which systemd boot doesn't. Yeah, well, if Grub works for you, then you can continue it using it, but it's new features are coming to systemd boot, and I don't know when they will happen for Grub. Well, I think we can agree to disagree. Hi. Which platforms are you supporting um, besides x86-64? Uh, probably, um, and currently, that's the only supported platform, x86. Any plans to go further? Currently not, but if you want to contribute, feel free. <laughs> Thanks. Wait, you said only x86? I, I have it running on ARM. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay, we just test against x86, but if it works on ARM, perfect. It's working wonderfully on ARM, so yeah, we can count that one too. But only on machines which actually do UEFI properly, which is not many. Yeah, that's required for system debut. Yeah. Um, my only question slash comment actually was just to sort of, I think, add a little more context to the Grub versus system debut thing, especially with measured boot. Grub's measure, measured boot options are just not granular enough. You, know, you literally have two PCRs. One of them is a composite of every file Grub touched on boot, which, of course, can change all the time, so it's useless for measurement. And then the other measurement that Grub takes is, I think, the command line, and that's it. Whereas, like, system boot has, what, 34 registers now? You know, way more stuff you can pick to build your policy of how you're doing it. So that, yeah, when it comes to measured boot, I don't really think you can do it in Grub in the real world. It, it's always going to just random stuff with that file loading. Whereas for system boot, like that's, for me, that's why we're moving to it. It's, it's all down to that. OK, thank you. I didn't know that about Grub. Are there any other questions? Um, also, uh, one thing I uh, want to add. Last I checked, um, Grub doesn't support Lux2 encryption for full disk encryption. Um, technically, there's a patch for Grub, but then it just uh, supports um, less secure um, encryption hash. So when you really want secure disk encryption, the only option is systemd boot currently. Yeah. Okay, then, thank you very much.